Well, good afternoon from a sunny New York City and greetings wherever you are in the world. I know I tend to spin the world on these introductions, but I'm simply going to say it is eight o'clock in the evening in Bayreuth, but it's also eternity in Bayreuth. And when we think of Richard Wagner, we think of these massive terms of hugeness, of eternity, of Ewigkeit, as the Germans say. And I am thrilled, genuinely thrilled, to have as my guest today Alex Ross, a writer. I just said to him that we breathe the same air very often, but we've never really had a conversation, who is best known, I suppose, as the music writer for The New Yorker, one of the lead music writers for The New Yorker, a great American magazine, if you don't know it, author of a wonderful book called The Rest is Noise, but especially today, a big, a big kite book, Wagnerism, Art and Politics in the Shadow of Music. It is, I, I'm seldom, as my listeners know, at a loss for words, but it's magnificent, it's epic, it is fascinating, it's inspiring. Um, to Alex, I'm just going to say two words, three words, congratulations and thank you. For this achievement and Alex Ross, welcome. Thank you so much, Fred. It's <clears throat> delight to be here, and and those those kind words are excessive, but very deeply uh, appreciated. No, I disagree. They're accurate. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Alex, I'm going to ask you to do one thing. If anything I say mischaracterizes your thought, please feel free to correct me, uh, because. These are big, big, wonderful, wonderful topics. I'm going to start by describing the book in the most general way as not being about Wagner's influence on music, but Wagner's influence on just about everything else. Is that accurate? Absolutely. Yeah. That's, okay. That's the core of the book. And when I teach Wagner, which I do a lot, one thing that I try to do is point out that there are many things where he intentionally wanted to have influence in his lifetime and after, but there were many things that he did not intend to influence, but that other people reached out and grabbed at him, at his mantle, at his art, and used what he created and what they perceived him to be for their own benefit, their own devices. Is that so? Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, the phenomenon called Wagnerism, <clears throat> as I understand it, has not to do with, with Wagnerites and the kind of, you know, immediate cult of Wagner and the sort of generations of, of, of people who have, you know, had a strong relationship with his work for, in, in one way or another, um, you know, although that's part of the narrative, but, but really the core of it is, Wagnerism as defined through artists, writers, intellectual figures, philosophers, commentators of all kinds, political figures, uh, people in, in all different fields who have had this more creative way of seizing on Wagner and, and sort of bringing Wagner into their own world, sort of making use of Wagner in some way. And it's not at all about slavish devotion. It's not really about a cult, although it's fun to, to observe the cult in, in all of its sort of curious forms. But this is really about the, the artist as spectator taking hold of, of Wagner and, and making an often unexpected, uh, idiosyncratic, uh, eccentric, uh, uh, a bizarre, uh, sort of, you know, otherwise um, uh, unanticipated uh, use of, of Wagner to their own ends, you know, so it's actually the opposite of, of sort of the, the listener kind of disappearing into Wagner's world and becoming sort of a vessel of Wagner's own thoughts, you know, it's very much the reverse process. And so Wagner himself is obviously at the center of everything. And, you know, I periodically engage with the man himself, the biography, the sort of circle of, of people around him, and of course, the works, the writings, et cetera, et cetera. But it's sort of liberating uh, not to have to really come to final 
conclusions, you know, about sort of Wagner and sort of all the kind of controversies and problems and sort of unresolved issues that, that surround Wagner. And there's sort of thousands of books that, that have been written uh, that, that engage with that. For me, you know, that's beside the point. I don't have to really end up deciding what Wagner might have wanted, what his intentions might have been, you know, in any given instance. It's what the other, it's, it's what the spectator uh, concluded, which in some cases may, you know, align with, with, with Wagner's own ideas, but in many cases it does not. You know, so this is, this is very much about uh, the reception of Wagner, the reaction, the kind of the, the, the afterlife, um, uh, the aftermath uh, of Wagner. And it's, an, it's a huge phenomenon. And what I observed sort of looking over the literature at an early stage is that, you know, while there were thousands of books about Wagner himself, and there are a number of uh, quite a few really fascinating studies of one aspect or another of what we call Wagnerism. Uh, no one had been foolish enough to try to cover the entire phenomenon in a single book. So, so that is what I, I, I tried to do. And you know, it's a very long book, and uh, it is stuffed full with <clears throat> names and 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 works, hundreds upon hundreds of them. And there's a lot that I left out. You know. Um, yeah, I, but <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was worth a try, I think, to to pay tribute to this remarkable event where a composer who was also a dramatist and many other things yeah. leapt outside yeah. of the realm of music and just launched this tidal wave of influence through all the arts. And, and through... So the sequel will be called Noch einmal, one more time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For the right. stuff you left out or the stuff that you've learned since. I'm going to yeah. just quickly read down the, the titles and subjects of some of the chapters, not because we're going to get into them all, but because I want our listeners to understand where you went with this. So Prelude, Death in Venice, we're going to talk a bit about actually Wagner's last days there. Rheingold, Wagner, Nietzsche, and the Ring, the Tristan Chord, Baudelaire and the Symbolists, the Swan Knight, Victorian Britain and Gilded Age America, Grail Temple, Esoteric Decadent and Satanic Wagner, Holy German Art, the Kaiserich, Kaiserreich and Fantasiecle Vienna, Nibelheim, Jewish and Black Wagner, Venusberg, Venusberg, uh, Feminist and Gay Wagner, Brunhilde's Rock, Willa Cather and the Singer novel. That was an amazing chapter. They all are, but that was completely unexpected to me. Magic Fire, Modernism, 1900 to 1914. Notung, The Sword, um, The First World War and Hitler's Youth, Ring of Power, Revolution and Russia. In other words, that he was not just idolized and used by the right, but also by the left. Flying Dutchman, Ulysses, The Wasteland and the Waves. James Joyce, T.S. Eliot, Virginia Woolf, wonderful chapter. Siegfried's Death, Nazi Germany and Thomas Mann. Ride of the Valkyries, film from Birth of the Nation to Apocalypse Now and The Wound, Wagnerism after 1945. What this book does, at least in my experience, is thankful I've had it to read for about two months here while having to read other books, but I read one chapter and then I start going back to the Willa Cathers and the T.S. Eliot's and the Baudelaire's or listening to music again. And I take those side roads and then I would come back and read the next chapter. So I have been living with this very blissfully for a couple of months. Did you consciously or perhaps not, whatever we mean by Wagnerian, and I don't mean Wagnerism, but Wagnerian in terms of scope and dimension, see in him or draw from him as a model in creating the book? Oh, well, I don't think so. <laughs> It seems sort of dangerous to try to imitate uh, Wagner. I mean, uh, you know, of course, you know, the sheer scope of the thing is just a mirror image of Wagner himself, his complexity, his many sidedness. You know, I mean, th this happened with Wagner because he was so fecund and, and sort of uncontrollable uh, a figure and, and so full of contradictions and so sort of impulses shot out in so many different uh, directions to the right, to the left, uh, sort of across the globe, uh, people of, of so many different uh, backgrounds. Uh, and this was because, you know, Wagner himself was, was really not a, a sort of single 
crisply definable personality. You know, he, he contained multitudes like, like Walt Whitman. Um, and so, yeah, the, the book was going to end up um, mirroring that. But yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to, I wanted to try to, to bring this mass of material under control. And, you know, that required, you know, a great deal of work of, of trying to find the narrative, trying to find the, the through lines that, that would kind of create the, the assemblages that, that, that I wanted in, in any given uh, chapter. And so, you know, I had, I knew sort of everything I wanted to touch on. And it was just a question of, of pulling it all together. And that was just, I was just sort of leaning on techniques that I've learned in my career as, as a writer, especially at the New Yorker, uh, in terms of sort of taking on an ambitious subject and and guiding the, the reader through it. And, um, you know, in, in the, the, the two books, especially my first book, The Rest is Noise, uh, you know, this, this was also a question of, of traversing sort of a very wide terrain and just sort of finding the narrative structure. Um, but of course, Wagner was was a supremely great uh, storyteller, um, and and so perhaps you know unconsciously I may have tried to to um, to imitate some of that, or sort of you know the light motif structure, you know, is just a, a sort of fundamentally useful kind of literary device, you know, to sort of have uh, certain uh, kind of uh, illusions uh, which which reappear you know periodically and sort of give give a sense of this sort of thread tying everything together and I enjoyed kind of uh, dropping in sort of um, uh, there's a, just certain figures who kept popping up uh, uh, in in different places and, and I sort of uh, enjoyed that that effect but um, no it, it was it was an enormous challenge and also just a pleasure you know and and you talking about you know stopping uh, with the different chapters and, and looking back and, and sort of reading uh, uh, or listening. Um, I mean, you know, this is why the book took 10 years, you know, because yeah. for me, as I was working, uh, I was constantly going on these detours, which were hugely enjoyable. You know, when it was writing about Virginia Woolf, I thought, well, I need to basically read or, or reread everything by Virginia Woolf just to make sure, you know, I haven't missed anything. And that's just, that's just a gigantic pleasure. And also to be going through this unbelievably rich period of cultural history and looking at everything through the lens of Wagner, I think allows uh, fresh and surprising uh, perspectives because, you know, we're not used to sort of uh, looking at Virginia Woolf uh, through Wagner. There's certain figures where it's a much more familiar lens with Thomas Mann, you know, people yeah. have been talking about Mann and, and, and Wagner uh, forever, um, but less so with Willa Cather or Virginia Woolf or, or someone like Kandinsky or, or, or Sergei Eisenstein, you know, it's been discussed, uh, but I think for, for a lot of readers, it just sort of hasn't crossed their mind. And, and yeah, the whole the whole experience was just immensely enriching. And there was a great sadness toward the end when I realized I was just no longer going to be going on these de detours and making these discoveries that, you know, often couldn't end up making it into the book, you know, just because I already had too much, but but just sort of the the, the pleasure of, of, of finding, of, of sort of coming across some unexpected uh, relationship. And, you know, it, it had to, it had to add, and then there was a kind of a melancholy in that. Did you, through the writing and through the research in the book, and when you did your detours, because I, readers don't know this, you, they should know this, Alex intimately and vividly understands music and connects to music and describes it incredibly well. Did you hear the music in your head that often was related to the subject matter that you were delving into? Yeah, I mean, I was sort of continuously listening to, to Wagner, you know, a lot of the time. I mean, of course, I have my other obligations as a, as a critic. So, you know, I always have stacks of CDs and, and you know, streams and sort of everything else going on. Um, but but I would I would always be going back to Wagner and I'd sort of come across a, a historical performance which which I hadn't known. Um, and yeah, there's are sections of the book where the artists I'm engaging with have themselves engaged with Wagner on some very detailed level, you know. So so Willa Cather writes about Fricka um, in in Rheingold, actually not in Valkyra, which is, seems to be kind of the most interesting moment for Fricka in the cycle, but no, it's she, she talks about her in, in, in Rheingold because 
her singer, uh, whom she's writing the fictional biography of in, in The Song of the Lark, uh, uh, Thea Kronborg is, is singing Rheingold Fricke uh, at the time. Or, you know, Thomas Mann uh, knew Wagner exceedingly well. Uh, so he would, he would, you know, have these, these moments where he was making these delightfully esoteric uh, allusions to something in, in Tristan, you know, one of his stories. Um, and, and so I'd sort of keep going back to, to, the, to the music. And I have to say, you know, even when I wasn't actively working on the book and I'd just be sort of engaging with, with Wagner in the sort of more casual way, just sort of listening through the recordings or going to performances, having the, the experience of uh, delving into, you know, how Wolf understood uh, Wagner, T.S. Eliot, uh, Joyce, um, uh, Philip K. Dick, uh, you know, so many others it would just sort of provide unexpected new perspectives, you know, as I was listening to the music. And so sort of being able to kind of listen to the music through the ears of, of these extraordinary uh, figures was, was very enriching. It just, like, just further complicated my, my relationship with Wagner, I think, in a, in a very constructive way. And, and hopefully that will also happen for readers of the book. I'm going to mention, I'll mention many things, but a couple right now is you wrote that writing this book has been the great education of my life. And when I teach the ring, I teach Wagner in general, but the ring specifically, one way that I describe it is that it is about Brunhilde's accumulation of knowledge. And so I went back and listened to uh, the closing scene of Gotthedammerung, when she says, alles weiß ich, now I know all. But I have to tell you, in my ears, though I've heard this hundreds of times, I heard Alex weiß ich. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, okay, well, <laughs> I'm down what you call the mystic abyss. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. Um, what do you mean by it's being the great education of your life? Well, I think everything that I've been talking about, just sort of this 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 immersion in, in this in this you know huge body of work um, and and the rediscoveries. You know, I mean, I, I I studied Joyce, you know, very closely in college. I ended up being an English major in college, and I wrote my thesis on. Joyce and a bunch of other stuff. It's sort of somewhat incomprehensible to me now um, <laughs> what exactly I was pursuing. Uh, but uh, so, you know, I, I, I thought I knew Joyce. Um, uh, but, you know, a number of years had passed uh, before I sort of went back to Ulysses or somewhere near the beginning of this process and, and reread Ulysses. Um, and it was an entirely different experience, not just because. Uh, you know, uh, I was sort of looking for the Wagnerian uh, traces uh, in the book, but simply because, you know, I was older and, and you relate to a kind of all embracing masterwork like that differently uh, when, you're, when you're older. You know, when I was young, I identified with the, the, the young, pretentious uh, uh, Stephen Dedalus, uh, mm -hmm. who, was, who was an image of Joyce as a young man. Um, and going back to it, I, I, of course, identified much more strongly with the, the older, the, the middle-aged uh, Leopold Bloom, um, uh, who seemed like a totally boring character to me <laughs> at the time. <laughs> and suddenly I was like, oh, okay, yes. <laughs> I understand <laughs> these, these uh, unfulfilled or unfulfillable longings and this sort of sense of vague regret and, and sort of descending over everything and so uh, so yeah that was you know just just to have the the excuse you know to to revisit uh so much of this work is is what i mean what sort of part of what really attracted me to the the whole subject to to begin with you know um because it is this strange sprawling uh history of culture you know from from the late 19th century sort of to the to the present day uh following the the Wagner thread. And there's just so much that I discovered. I mean, you were talking about, you know, learning the ring or sort of teaching the ring um, and in just sort of going through the ring and studying its, its sources, of course, is just a great education in itself in mythology, um, in, in sort of comparative mythology and all of Wagner's sources, uh, in philosophy, you know, as you, as you study the, the transition in Wagner's thought from the sort of young Hegelians, uh, Feuerbach uh, to Schopenhauer and uh, the philosophy of, of renunciation and how that aligns with the, 
the plot of the cycle as, as Votan reaches that tremendous moment uh, where he, he realizes he must give up power um, and on through you know, the, the, the remainder of the cycle. And, and so uh, you just, you know, as you read up uh, on, on, on these subjects, you, you just sort of learn so much. And, and for me also, you know, I, um, I was fairly well versed in, in writing about literature, and I had done so at the at the New Yorker. And as I mentioned, I studied literature. You know, I'd barely ever written about uh, architecture uh, or, or or dance or or the visual arts, really. Although I, I was a, a sort of part time painter uh, when I was growing up, um, and and so that was a learning process, not only of the material, but you know how to write about um, uh, these subjects. And we just come grinding to a halt because I know tricks to fall back on. I would spend a whole afternoon trying to come up with, you know, two adequate sentences about Lewis Sullivan, uh, you know, the great American architect, uh, you know, because I just, you know, it, it was, it was new to me. Um, uh, but that was just part of the, part of the education. Um, and then I would just sort of, sometimes having gone on those detours, I would end up sort of spinning off a whole separate article for the New Yorker. Uh, uh, about Mallarmé, for example, yeah. because I just spent so much time staring at Mallarmé and trying to figure out <laughs> what on earth was going on uh, in, in his uh, uh, poems. And, you know, there ends up being just sort of a, one section uh, of the book uh, devoted to him and his complex relationship with Wagner. Uh, but I just, you know, so wanted to pursue that further. And so the wonderful thing about being at the New Yorker is, is I am allowed to kind of pursue my my eccentric uh, interests and, and sort of fashion articles from them. So yeah, so the, it just kept expanding, and, and I think I'll, I'll probably continue pursuing uh, all of these sort of lines of investigation. You know, even past the point where I'm still thinking about Wagner per se and Wagnerism. There's just sort of uh, so much more that I want to delve into. Um, and yeah, I just hope that, that the, the reader will, will have something of the same experience, you know, of I have no of doubt. discovery. In, in my case, what happened was, and I agree with you and was going to say the same thing, there are benefits to getting older. And one is that we understand more, we understand differently. Uh, you mentioned, by the way, about Votan being unwilling to relinquish power and you and I are Americans and right now we're witnessing this in the United States and in which we have a head of state who will not walk off the stage, so to speak, and we're having a bit of a crisis that we're going to have to get through. But when we witness and experience these things, I often turn to artists such as Wagner for their insights about how human behavior works. And, and we're watching some, something of that now. But what I was gonna say was, I went back to Baudelaire mm -hmm. because this is a yellowing little penguin book when they still were paid for in pence and so on, 30, 95p. Um, I used this book 46 years ago as an undergraduate and the poems are in French on one side and we'd recite them in French and I was studying French and then in English on the other side. But I didn't really know Tannhäuser terribly well when I was an undergraduate. I heard it, but I didn't know it. Um, so when you talk about the uh, Fleur de Mal, the Flowers of Evil, the poems that uh, Baudelaire wrote. So I'm just gonna quickly read a short one, Destruction. The devil stirs beside me constantly, floats round me like an air impalpable. I feel him in my lungs, incendiary, bringing desires eternal, culpable. Sometimes aware of my great love of art, he takes a woman's shape, voluptuous, and with some lame excuse, the hypocrite, accustoms me to filters infamous, filters being potions and such. And so far from God's sight, he leads me on panting and broken with exhaustion into the plains of tedium profound and casts into my eyes confusion, worn dirty clothes, open infested wounds, deadly apparel of destruction. And that's Tannoy's. <laughs> um, could you talk a bit about this relationship of, of Baudelaire and his influence and what he experienced of Wagner in his time in Paris? 
Yeah, well, it's very important because Baudelaire is really the beginning of this thing we call Wagnerism. It, it, this was sort of the flashpoint. Um, 1861, uh, Baudelaire published this astonishing essay, uh, Richard Wagner and Tannhäuser in Paris. Now there had already been interest in Wagner in France um, and uh, the, the great uh, bohemian writer, uh, uh, Gerard de Nerval um, had, <clears throat> had already sort of, uh, uh, paid heed to Wagner, noticed uh, Wagner. Um, and so there's a sense that, you know, Wagner especially understood as an artist who was dealing in dream states, liminal realms, uh, uh, uncontrollable forces, uh, a kind of, you know, sensuality uh, welling up, uh, this conflict between between the, the, the sacred and, and, and the sensual, which is of course the, the, at the heart of Tannhäuser. So sort of everything in Wagner, which is chaotic and, and, and dark and, and sort of you know, decadent and, and, and sort of suspect, uh, which is you know, a fair amount of what Wagner is about. You know, the, the French were just fascinated by that um, and, and saw him as just a, a, a very important wellspring you know, of, of what was coming to the fore in, in, in French art. Um, and so it was already sort of underway. But uh, Baudelaire uh, was sort of the turning point. And, and he was you know, a major influence, of course, in, in French uh, literature and, and French culture. And he sort of gave the signal <clears throat> that, that, that from now on, uh, Wagner was just going to be uh, a hero of, of the French avant-garde, of, of French Bohemia. And it happened um, in, in the periods sort of leading up to this famous scandalous performance of Tannhäuser uh, at the Paris Opera in 1861. Uh, Wagner had come to Paris at the end of 1859 uh, with the belief that he could establish himself in, in, in Paris and launch uh, Tristan und Isolde, which had not yet been performed, which had very recently been uh, completed. Of course, earlier in life, he had had this, this youthful period in, in Paris where, where he had not at all uh, broken through and in his own mind suffered, you know, great humiliation, uh, you know, from, from, the, from the French. Um, but, you know, at, by the end of that decade, uh, he was, you know, now a major figure in, in opera and, and music, uh, although he was one who was uh, in exile from, from Germany. Uh, so that was the plan. Uh, and he came and he first organized this series of three concerts uh, at the Théâtre Italien. Uh, with or excerpts um, from, from the operas, uh, including the, the prelude to Tristan. And Baudelaire was there, he went to all three concerts um, and it was an overwhelming experience for him. Uh, and he wrote this extraordinary letter to Wagner uh, where, where he said, you know, this has just been the most extraordinary musical experience of my life. And, and I felt overwhelmed and ov overpowered. He said he felt penetrated uh, by, by Wagner. Um, uh, this is sort of a kind of eyebrow raising uh, image to use. And uh, it was just sort of gigantically effusive. Um, uh, and uh, uh, Wagner was very appreciative of, of this uh, letter and uh, recognized how useful it would be to him uh, to have this, this, this major figure in French culture you know, on his side. Whether he, he actually kind of recognized what Baudelaire was seeing in his own work is hard to know. Um, I think there would have been aspects to what Wagner was responding, what Baudelaire was responding to, which would have been foreign to him. You know, this, this, this interest in uh, the demonic, uh, uh, the satanic, uh, you know, in, in sort of this sort of particular kind of, of uh, uh, kind of underworld, uh, which, which Baudelaire found so uh, attractive, uh, I think was less important to Wagner, even if he had a sort of flair for kind of summoning up, you know, the dark and the demonic, you know, in, in, in his music, uh, he just he just did not have all, at all the same uh, mentality as, as Baudelaire, who kind of relished uh, uh, this sort of sense of sort of descending into the, in the sort of the social underworld. Uh, but in any case, um, uh, you know, despite the kind of fairly obvious disparity between between what Baudelaire was talking about and, and, and sort of 
Wagner's own intentions, you know, as far as we can understand, understand them. Uh, Wagner knew this, this was, you know, a, a valuable uh, a kind of shift for him. And, and it, it sort of, it was evidence of the expansion of the appeal, appeal of his work. Um, and, and Baudelaire went even further in, in this remarkable essay, um, which was published right after the, the scandal of 1861, where instead of Tristan, which was hopeless, there was no way Tristan was going to be performed at the Paris Opera. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it, it was uh, the earlier opera of Tannhäuser, um, which caused the scandal not so much of, because of the music itself, uh, but because of this very complicated kind of political and social issue around the left and the right in, in, in France and the emperor and, and uh, you know, just Wagner got sort of caught up in this uh, political melee. Uh, and it's just a very typical kind of French routine of those sort of this this enormous scandal with sort of different camps of people sort of yelling uh, at each other um, and and so uh, uh, sort of all that came to an end in terms of Wagner's hopes for for a, a sort of a, a new career in in Paris, but Baudelaire's uh, incredibly sophisticated uh, appreciation for for Wagner um, and his installation of, of Wagner as this symbol of of the artist as antagonist uh, to the establishment, uh, as explorer of, of these other realms, as someone who is unleashing uh, these extraordinary forces. Now that had huge influence uh, over sort of subsequent generations of French artists. Uh, and so from there on, you know, as I said, you know, Wagner was a hero. And you know, after Baudelaire came Villiers de Lille Dame and Huismans and, and Mallarmé and uh, Odilon Rodon, a number of other painters uh, identified with, with Wagner. And so French, this French version of Wagner uh, um, is just at the core of this whole phenomenon that I'm, that I'm talking about, where sort of Wagner takes a whole new life um, when he's transposed in, into a different world. Do you have any thoughts about Wagner and Berlioz? Yeah, it's, it's it's an interesting question. It, it was a um, <clears throat> it was a, a sort of a matter of clashing personalities uh, to to a great extent, and um, particularly when Wagner arrived back in Paris earlier, uh, Berlioz had been quite friendly uh, to Wagner and recognized him as, a, as someone who was um, uh, similarly sort of exploring new musical possibilities. And, and Wagner was influenced uh, by, by Berlioz, uh, by the Symphony Fantastique and, and Romeo and Juliet. Um, but by the time Wagner came back, uh, I think Berlioz saw him as, as something of a threat. Um, and, you know, in Berlioz's mind, you know, it, it should have been Les Troyons, uh, which was, you know, being uh, done in, in grand style uh, at, at the opera. And, and so he felt uh, understandably, I think, uh, uh, mistreated and, and marginalized. And so sort of here's this sort of German composer being given this, this grand stage. And there was also kind of a, a turn, stylistic turn in the later Berlioz, uh, uh, sort of somewhat away from this sort of very uh, flamboyantly daring uh, language of the earlier music. There's kind of a new classicism uh, um, in, in the, in the uh, 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 in Trion's sort of later works, uh, which is kind of at odds with, with the direction of Wagner's uh, work, especially in Tristan. You know, so I think he had actually, it wasn't just a matter of jealousy or envy or sort of resentment. I mean, there was, I think, musical problems which that Berlioz had with Tristan in particular. And, and, and he, he, he wrote a, a rather a critical review uh, uh, or a review that was a very mixed review, but he had sort of critical remarks to make about uh, uh, Tristan in particular, a sort of chromatic moaning. <laughs> and it's strange, you know, because I mean, Berlioz was just a, 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 an equally daring artist. And, and you know, uh, of course, chromatic moaning was just the kind of phrase that people would have thrown it at the Symphony Fantastique. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's 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 something of a pity. I, I know Wagner, of course, should take blame as well because Wagner was just dreadful at at, at sort of maintaining uh, these kinds of relationships. He would sort of just take what he needed from from someone and just kind of uh, 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 sort of uh, show no sign of gratitude or or, <laughs> or sort of mutual kind of you know uh, uh, obligation. Um, 
So a few thoughts have piled up. I'm just going to say in passing, because then I want to get to the next thing about Tristan, actually. Um, number one, if I recall either the first performance or the first complete performance of Le Trayon by Berlioz was in Germany, in Karlsruhe. And I find it interesting that these two men found more appeal outside of their lands, although Wagner did in the German-speaking lands have a lot of controversial appeal, but Berlioz was more embraced by the Germans than he mm -hmm. was. Yeah, by Hans von Bülow. Uh, yeah, that's, you know, that, I mean, they were both figures who of course had, had incredibly uh, difficult relationships with sort of the, the, the conventional musical establishment, you know, in, in each of their, their home countries um, and just had built up this kind of legacy of, of just sort of just, you know, people rolling their eyes, you know, <laughs> at, at Berlioz and, and, and Wagner. Um, and, and so it's just, it's understandable that this are transposed to, to a whole different world. People could actually sort of listen to the, the music in this fresh way and, and sort of really discover the, the power of it, you know, without having to sort of see them as just these, these, you know, impossible kind of troublemakers, <laughs> uh, which is, was their, their reputation um, in, in either milieu. Yep. Do you think that Wagner learned anything from Berlioz, at least from his music, in terms of orchestration? Oh, very much so, yeah. I mean, there's that passage in Romeo and Juliet, which sounds a lot like Tristan, you know, and, and um, you know, certainly the, the, the orchestration, this, especially this, this sort of uh, uh, brilliantly kind of unexpected use of, of instruments and combinations of, of instruments um, in, in Berlioz. It's sort of almost the, the kind of <clears throat> basis of, of Wagner's orchestration. But then Wagner's orchestration is, is, is very different. You know, I mean, there's kind of a, uh, a, a kind of um, jaggedness, uh, a kind of um, sort of surface uh, brokenness uh, to, to Berlioz's uh, orchestration, which is just very arresting, just how, how kind of sort of uh, instruments kind of poke through the texture and kind of in, 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 in very striking ways. And there's a kind of sense of a I think an instability uh, to the orchestral mass in Berlioz and with Wagner, you know, everything is so much more blended. Um, and, and so sort of the, the, the combinations uh, are sort of these, just sort of these fusions of, of instruments, um, uh, you know, thinking of the, the, the blend of oboe and trumpet um, in, in uh, Parsifal in the, in, the, in the prelude. And, and, you know, although of course Wagner could have his moments of, of shock where sort of the, the orchestra does seem to, you know, break to pieces uh, uh, before your ears. Um, but I think that that is a, a difference uh, between them, um, and and there's also I think there's a, there's an elegance uh, in Berlioz, uh, a very different kind of characteristic. But you know there, there's kind of a there's sort of this melodic gracefulness um, in in Berlioz, which is you know somewhat uh, absent <laughs> from from Wagner, although okay. you know, he graceful um, when he when he wanted. Another to Another thing I wanted to add because I just as an expression of understanding. I feel that from your writing and your discussion that you have walked with Wagner and Wagner has walked with you for a very, very long time. And I have the same experience with Michelangelo, who's been an ongoing walking companion and study companion and muse and teacher for a very long time, which doesn't mean that they're not other people. But somehow there's something about certain creative figures or maybe political figures who just capture a person and it's it's a very gratifying transporting all consuming thing when someone can do that and and I advise people in our lives when everything's so fractured and traumatic and you know Wagner in his lifetime propagated but also dealt with chaos and paranoia and I think that many people in Wagner find either answers or reinforcement of chaos and paranoia or the opposite. Michelangelo had to deal with 13 different popes in his lifetime and put aside projects. There was one sculpture it took him 45 years to do. Uh, the way with the ring cycle, Wagner worked on it over 25 years and stopped and started and so forth. And these figures in their writings and in their creativity, not to mention their creative, their creations, but their creativity,
I find profoundly inspiring. And so I, I do want to now transfer over to Tristan, if I could. Mm -hmm. um, you and I both live in New York, and you often review performances at the Metropolitan Opera. I worked at the Metropolitan Opera in the 1980s, just in full disclosure. And Wagner died in February of 1883. The Metropolitan Opera had its very first performance in October of 1883 and was already being built and under construction. And the first opera they did was Faust by Gounod. And Lohengrin came along pretty quickly. It was the third opera to be done. It was Faust, Mignon, and Lohengrin, was, which was sung in Italian in the first year. And so I decided to go back and look in the Met archives and see how much Wagner was done early on because there's a term that you know called Wagner cities or Wagner capitals, places such as Bologna in Italy and Barcelona in Spain that have particular depth of appreciation and feeling for the works of Wagner and residents that may have to do with their own politics or aesthetic points of view. And New York is a Wagner capital. So in looking back over this, I found that it was Lohengrin, Valkyra quickly came after, then Die Meistersinger, Tannhäuser in the Dresden in the, the 1845 version, Rienzi, then Tristan and Isolde had its U.S. premiere, and um, the New York Times headline, very long headline, first performance in America of a work not wanted outside of Germany and not often there, beginning of the end of the craze for symphonic music and opera. That was the headline. And then in the article, the writer who was not attributed, we think it was W.J. Henderson, we're not sure, said, Wagner is no more, meaning he had died in 1883. And the genius and savoir faire, the exercise of which made his theories temporarily tenable, are interred with his bones. We should not be surprised if Wagnerism, pure, simple, and exclusive as genuine Wagnerism must be, had said its final word in New York. <laughs> um, wishful thinking. <laughs> wishful thinking. And the, I, then before we get into Tristan and Parsifal, I want to point one other thing out that you're going to expand on. The fact that the first performance of Parsifal done outside of Bayreuth, because listeners may know that the Feshbielhaus in Bayreuth opened in 1876 with a presentation of The Ring. Parsifal was written specifically for the design and the acoustics of that theater and premiered in 1882 when he died a few months after. Um, the U.S. premiere was December 24th, 1903 at the Met. And it was the first stage performance of Parsifal outside of Bayreuth. Why is that? Well, it's, it's a fascinating story. I mean, the whole story of American Wagnerism is, is really interesting when it goes <clears throat> back to the 1850s. Uh, and it has a lot to do, I think, with the German immigration, uh, because an enormous number of Germans came over to America around 1848 or after 1848. A number of them were fleeing from the revolution, from, from, the, from the reaction to the, the, the revolution, sort of the restoration after the failure of the uh, revolutions of 1848 and 49. And of course, Wagner participated in the uprising in Dresden in 1849, and that's why he had to go into exile. And so these were kind of liberal, left-leaning, uh, left uh, revolutionary uh, people who, who came over to, um, to America in very large numbers. Uh, and so they, they were sort of the, the core of this great uh, German uh, immigration. And there were musicians uh, who came over and brought with them uh, German repertory, which was not as well known. Uh, there's a heavy sort of Italian uh, orientation, I think, in America in the sort of early, mid 19th century. Um, and so groups like the, the Germania uh, Musical Society uh, uh, spread the word about Wagner um, and, and uh, other, uh, other 19th century German composers. So it was sort of slowly building. Um, and 
And then this very interesting thing happened with the Met in the 1880s. Um, and, and the first season was an Italian season, uh, everything in, in sung in Italian. Um, uh, and it was a failure, a total failure. Um, and it really, the, the mat was sort of in, in danger of, of, of closing. You know, it just it has been, been a, sort of very problematic financially. Um, and then it was to a great extent saved by this, this big change in orientation where basically the mat now converted to a German opera house um, and uh, Leopold Damrosch uh, was, was hired uh, as, as the music director and Damrosch was uh, knew Wagner himself and, and, and was sort of well-versed in, in, in the Wagner uh, operas. Uh, and he died uh, quite shortly after that appointment um, and then uh, uh, Anton Seidel uh, uh, came in um, and, and led this kind of golden age of, of Wagner performance um, at, at the Met. And there was just enormous quantities of, of uh, Wagner. I think the statistic is that more than half of the operas uh, performed in this uh, uh, period through the end of the 80s uh, were by Wagner. Um, and, and so it was just Wagner day in, day out. Obviously there were some who presented uh, this, this tsunami of, of uh, Wagner uh, uh, as, as that review uh, evidences. But there was also this, this great enthusiasm, uh, this very strong response, uh, which I think has complicated, uh, complicated background. I mean, I think it somehow Wagner began resonating with, with American uh, mythology in, in a sense, and sort of the, the idea of the American hero is kind of grafted on to, to Siegfried, uh, the kind of, you know, pioneer, the sort of, of, the, of the frontier, the explorer of the, of the Wild West. Uh, uh, there's this, this desire of sort of Wagner to elevate itself culturally um, and sort of the, the grandest, most lavish thing you could do <laughs> uh, in the cultural sphere, perhaps, was to put on performances of Wagner operas, you know, in the highest style. And I think that that urge to kind of Americanize uh, Wagner and sort of merge um, uh, uh, sort of American uh, 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 kind of this 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 expansionist spirit in, in America with European inheritance uh, led to this remarkable event, uh, the Parsifal of 1903. Um, and the reason why they were able to do it uh, was that uh, Wagner's works were were not under copyright. Uh, Parsifal was not under copyright uh, because. Uh, uh, the U.S. was not a signatory to the Bern uh, Convention, and the whole what, what copyright meant is sort of very complicated. Kind of in this period, it was very sort of chaotic, uh, but um, but but the Americans felt uh, that they had sort of uh, 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 right to to the work, and in fact, it was there was no sort of legal case uh, uh, that could stop them. Uh, Cosima Wagner attempted to bring such a case, um, and and it was a failure. Uh, and so Wagner went ahead versus Conrad. Yes. <laughs> um, and so the performance went ahead. Uh, Cosmo was incensed and, and, and banned, uh, you know, a number of the singers from, from performing in, in Bayreuth because of their participation uh, in this, this scandalous uh, Parsifal. But, you know, in the American context, it was something that, that, that people took great pride in, you know, this, uh, and, and it seems to have been a, a fairly strong, you know, production of, of Parsifal uh, overall. And, and so it was this declaration, uh, another form of declaring that Wagner did belong to, to everyone. He was not simply a German property or even a, a European uh, property. So it was a great event and it became kind of a, a popular culture phenomenon. You know, there was a, um, uh, in, in sort of the world of New York fashion, there was a particular hue of blue, uh, the Parsifal blue, uh, which was sort of seen in, in fashions that spring. Uh, there was a Parsifal car, um, and there was this uh, sort of ridiculous movie that the Edison Company made uh, based on, on uh, Parsifal. And, and so it was this moment where where Wagner is, is merging kind of not only with, with sort of American high culture, aspirations, but with with American popular culture, you know, sort of the, the mainstream. Um, and Parsifal is mentioned in popular songs of the of the period. And 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 so this is um to look back on it just sort of causes great wonder, you know, to see to see this Parsifal, you know, on the top page of, of uh, the New York Times. Uh, and and this this it was just an enormous cultural event at the time.
Alex, in my experience at the Met, I was the performance manager, which meant that I had a lot of dealings with the artists and production teams backstage, but was also responsible for the needs of the public, at least some of the needs. And we used to do Parsifal very often around Easter, around Good Friday for all the associations that opera has with that time of the year and with the Christian implications of that. But what I was told by my predecessor, and I believed her because there was no reason not to, but I had no idea the dimension, was the particular audience that would turn out for Parsifal as if they were going to Lourdes for a final cure. And the house doctors at the Met warned me that I needed to staff specially because we would have many people with cancer, later with AIDS and HIV, people with terminal illnesses of one kind or another. And we had to arrange, or I was not had to, I wanted to arrange to bring all of these people for their Parsifal experience. And I met many regular subscribers to the Met who were ill and they would say to me in December, I'm going to try to make it to late March so that Parsifal will be my last opera. And there's something they felt about either the emotional journey, the spiritual journey, many of them described healing in that opera, the way you go to a, a spring or a source to try to get healing from the waters. Um, did you come across that? Have you ever interviewed people who went religiously to that opera, not for the Christianity, but for the, the physical healing? Uh, that's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating to hear those stories. And, and that sort of so recently, you know, Parsifal still had this reputation, which I very much had, you know, at the end of the 19th century as some kind of almost sort of spiritual source of power. I mean, I, I haven't sort of personally talked to people really who've had that relationship with Parsifal, but I certainly see it in the history uh, of, of the work. And sort of the whole reason why people made this pilgrimage to Bayreuth early on was especially about Parsifal um, because, you know, until that 1903 performance, uh, it was the only place where you could hear the opera complete and sort of see it uh, on stage. Uh, and it did have something of the nature of a, of a sort of trip to uh, a, a spa, uh, to, to a sort of a, 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 a cure, a uh, cool house, a uh, uh, cool ort, um, and, and, you know, this, this place where you sort of, you emerge cleansed and, and healed. And there, there was kind of a um, uh, sort of broader appeal. It, it's not simply a Christian opera. And, and so it didn't simply appeal to, to uh, uh, Christian uh, listeners or sort of, you know, actively uh, uh, observantly Christian uh, listeners, you know, because the sources of it uh, are multiple. Um, and, you know, Wagner, one extraordinary aspect of, of Wagner's thinking um, is his ability to see patterns across different traditions, uh, sort of, so with, with mythic traditions, you know, he's able to, to see how uh, uh, the, the the stories of the ring are, are sort of duplicated uh, in in different ways in, in, in different uh, traditions, um, and and you know with uh, with this idea of the of the Grail quest, you know he sort of he sees kind of the, the sort of multiple manifestations of that in in, in west uh, in the west in the east, um, and so he's he's kind of a master of of comparative mythology, um, and and none other than Claude Levi Strauss, um, uh, the the Godfather. Of, of structuralism uh, who, who uh, so brilliantly uh, analyzed uh, these sort of common patterns across uh, world myths, uh, hailed uh, Wagner as, as, a, as a forerunner, as a progenitor of his field, just because of this analytic gift uh, that he had, which, which emerges in the writings and not just in the operas. Um, and so that's what's going on in Parsifal. And he's sort of, he's sort of seeing the, 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 the Christian story um, but he's he's sort of aligning it 
with uh, uh, stories out of uh, Eastern uh, tradition, uh, Buddhism uh, and uh, Hinduism, even uh, Islam, uh, perhaps uh, uh, pagan traditions. You know, the the wounded king, the suffering king, the the, the Fisher King, uh, uh, and then his his healing, uh, his resurrection. You know, and and so it's it's treating religion and, and spirituality as another form of kind of compilation of, of, of mythic tales. And you know, some people at the time had great trouble with that, you know, because they didn't want to see Christianity treated uh, as kind of one of a number of, of sort of narratives. <laughs> um, and so the, the opera was thought to be uh, blasphemous uh, by some in terms of how it uh, treated the Christian tradition. Uh, but for many other people, it was refreshing. And, and there was this great fad around the end of the 19th century for combinations of, of different religious traditions, especially West and East. Uh, theosophy uh, uh, in particular uh, was sort of built around exactly that kind of uh, fusion. And there were many theosophists uh, uh, who had a strong relationship with Wagner and also uh, Rudolf Steiner uh, and anthroposophy. Um, and, and so just Wagner was kind of this, this fascinating source of ideas about spiritual, the spiritual, the mystical, the occult, uh, the, the esoteric uh, kind of sort of early aspects of, of, of hippie culture, you know, kind of were manifesting themselves in, in Europe, uh, Switzerland and other places. And, and so yes. you know, those people kind of, you know, responded to Wagner. So it's, it's a very broad spiritual phenomenon. And so, yeah, you can, you can, you can see how people could have that reaction to Parsifal and the extraordinary aura um, in this music without necessarily being invested in, in a particular religious belief system. Something I've grappled with for a really long time, like decades regarding Wagner is that we know very, very well his thoughts about Jews and Judaism. And, and that's been a topic that has been written about extensively and you wrote beautifully about it in this book. But I have never really read that much about what we can either call the Christian Wagner or Wagner the Christian. And when I look at his works, his operas, and see characters who are in one way or another centered around Christianity, uh, so Tannhäuser and Elizabeth in that opera, and Lohengrin certainly, and Parsifal, and certain other works and then a certain more, let's say benevolent Christianity that you might find in Meisterzinger. I don't, I couldn't begin to describe Wagner the Christian and wonder, have always wondered about him. Uh, I heard someone once say that Wagner wrote Parsifal in part to make sure he could get into heaven because of all of his transgressions earlier on. And I, I don't, I mean, Christianity is a very broad term and it includes Catholicism, Protestantism and many, many other practices of the belief in the following of the teachings and life of Jesus Christ. But where would you put him in this as a man first and then how it's expressed in his works? That's a difficult question. <clears throat> you know, I mean, Wagner's religiosity uh, well, it fluctuated, it took various forms. I mean, he, he was raised a Christian and, and sort of that, that sort of remained part of, very strong part of his makeup throughout um, his life. Uh, but he sort of would, would, would bend away from it and then, and then come back to it. I mean, there's sort of, there's a sense with the ring cycle that, that he really is almost subscribing to, to a revival of, of pagan belief, which I don't think he seriously was. Uh, but there were some who came after him, the sort of you know, Germanic kind of neo-pagan uh, movements that have often referred to Wagner. And so he, he, he supplied rich material uh, for that. You know, then with, with Meisterzinger and sort of the somewhat more outwardly conservative later Wagner culminating in Parsifal, so the, the sort of the, the Christian apparatus comes back to the fore. But with Wagner, um, whatever his actual personal practices were, uh, which it is hard to pin down and it just often seems just dependent on 
whatever he was interested in the time and whatever he where he, where he was living and and so what was around him and what he was working on you know I mean this sort of uh, in this late period where he was spending so much time in in Italy uh, in his last years uh, you feel as though there's kind of this mystical Catholicism uh, kind of entering the the picture um, and or and desire that. for better food. Yeah, yeah, that too, um, and that, I think that's part of the atmosphere of, of of Parsifal. But you know, ultimately with Wagner, I mean, it is just it is everything sort of goes into the work, and so it's just about what are the what are the demands of of the work, and sort of how is spirituality uh, going to function you know, as part of the the theatrical experience. Um, but what I find very compelling is a sense that sort of not in terms of doctrinaire religious thought but in terms simply of the teachings of certain traditions, a Christian um, a tradition, uh, but also the, the Eastern uh, traditions, sort of teachings about empathy um, and about compassion, uh, about humility, uh, about uh, sort of uh, gaining wisdom uh, and, and gaining wisdom about other people. I mean, these themes are, are very, central to the Wagner operas. And, and it seems ironic because, you know, all of these qualities are not ones that we readily assign to Wagner personally, uh, humility, compassion, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, he, he was just so problematic as a, as a personality and, and uh, was, was not someone who can be considered spectacularly giving, you know, to, to, to other people. Although he was not, you know, I always, I always have this urge to, to defend him against the idea that he was just some sort of completely horrible human being, and, you know, and he was not one of the worst people who've ever lived, you know, and, and he did have attractive sides to his personality as well. But all that sort of is aside the point, you know, because what matters is what's going on in, in the work. And, and so, yes, I mean, uh, the, the theme of, I mean, one of the themes that I just find most compelling in Wagner is this sense of, of, Humility, the sort of giving up of, of sort of youthful aspirations toward toward power, toward toward control, toward mastery, uh, and and something that sort of happens, especially in, in in middle age, where you just sort of realize, you know, so many of your grand goals are sort of not going to come to fruition. It's about sort of sort of living with, you know, uh, what what you have received and kind of accepting your own limitations, um, and that's sort of a fundamental human psychological theme which is so much of what the ring, for example, is about, you know, Wotan's acceptance of his powerlessness uh, is for me, absolutely one of the most extraordinary moments, not only in Wagner, but sort of in the entire history of music, uh, the scene in act two, where, where Wotan plunges from this position of great confidence that his grand scheme to win back the ring through his human hero son, Sigmund, uh, is, is, a total delusion um, and has no chance of success. Fricka confronting him with that fact and the, and the sort of psychological plunge uh, that follows this flailing, this self-pity, um, uh, this rage, this resentment, but eventually leading to a place of some peace, some acceptance. We never really see Botan arriving there, we kind of surmise that, that he's reached that position. Um, and, and, and go to Demerung, you know, he's not on stage, but we hear Valtrauta and, and Brunhilde uh, talking about him. Uh, uh, Rua, Rua, you know, rest yeah. God. You have the sense that finally Wotan has, has achieved some, some sort of place of peace, but we actually really don't see it. You know, in Valkyra, he's still just raging, you know, from, from beginning to end. But it is, it is so psychologically powerful, it is so acute. Um, and, and, and I think this has a spiritual dimension to it, you know, just this idea of, of, of acceptance of, of loss, uh, of ex experience of grief, uh, of, of, of humility, that there's sort of their forces sort of higher than, than our own kind of uh, uh, naked human ambitions. You know, this is in Meistersinger, uh, Hans Sachs is another portrait of this uh, uh, mentality, this, this, this evolution. Um, and then of course, Parsifal, which is all about um, compassion um, and is sort of a, a celebration uh, ultimately of, of that higher form of love. So yeah, it's, you know, it's, Wagner is a deeply spiritual composer, whether, whether you like it or not. <laughs> Alex, in your talking now, I remember that you wrote a really wonderful article 
number of years ago, you'd be able to tell me when about that scene in the second act of Valkyra. And you interviewed the mezzo-soprano Stephanie Blythe, who was singing uh, Fricka at the time. And both you and she in that article were so vivid in, in explaining what you just alluded to. So I hope that readers and listeners will go back and look up that article. I, I don't know if you remember the title of the article or but. I know you've done a lot um, since, but <laughs> but it was great. Um, well, we'll find uh, it. Um, yeah, it's uh, really. I mean, the the, it, the the challenge that I set myself in that article uh, was to to talk about one brief moment in in Wagner, kind of in the spirit of you know, always look at Wagner just sort of in this biggest perspective. But why not sort of really zero in on one moment to try to figure out sort of everything that's invested in that moment. And the moment that I choose is actually just a purely orchestral passage that comes at the end of that Fricka Votan scene, just this slow rising phrase in the orchestra, which every time I've heard the opera, I'm waiting for it. It's so beautiful, but it, it lasts, uh, it, it goes away so quickly that I always feel sort of, you know, I'm sort of trying to grasp it and it sort of, it, it sort of it evaporates before I can really take hold of it. Um, and, and I've wondered, you know, what is going on in, in that passage and what does it mean? And so I talked to a number of conductors and I talked to several singers uh, kind of exploring the, the, the layers uh, behind that. It does, it has something to do with Votan and Fricka uh, saying farewell, but it also has something to do with Vot um, Fricka and Brunhilde. Um, and and sort of uh, Fricka's instructions uh, uh, to Brunhilde not to interfere um, when when uh, Sigmund and and Hunding uh, must must fight and and Sigmund must die he's destined to die uh, and Brunhilde doesn't listen and she does try to interfere but eventually all the way at the end of the of the cycle she is she is picked up on that sense of acceptance uh, and sort of that the spirit of that instruction uh, that Fricka uh, has has given to her. So yeah, and I find it very moving to listen to uh, Stephanie Blythe talk about that character and, and how she's sort of too often portrayed as this kind of interfering right. harpy, you know, and the, I think there's kind of a, a, a misogyny at work there in terms of how that that, that character is often pictured. And and Wagner, it goes deeper than that for, for Wagner. I mean, he, he he invites you to look at her that way, but then he sort of encourages you, know, sort of think more deeply about Fricka. And that's why I also love that that passage in um, the Song of the Lark in Willa Cather, where, where she talks about Fricka. And there's this one moment just this two word sentence uh, where Thea Kronborg, the singer says, Fricka knows. She doesn't say what, Fricka knows. Um, but but you, can, you can surmise that this is some sort of deeper wisdom, which, which has to do with, with, I think Fricka being a woman and, and her understanding of, of the male quest for power, uh, which she comments on in, in, in Ryan Gold, this endless striving after power. Um, and it's that sense of, of knowledge of wisdom, which also you know, eventually surfaces in Brunhilde. And you quoted, Alice, Alice, Alice. Alex, Alex. Alex. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know, I know all. And what, <laughs> and what is it? What is it that Fricka knows? What is it that Brunhilde yeah. knows? You know, it's, it's not spelled out. Um, and how in Wagner, I often find that it's the women who gain the knowledge and the men who repeat their, yeah. um, their damaging, self-harming patterns very often for yeah, yeah. some reason. Um, yeah, you know, Hilda has the great character arc, you know, the, the, yeah. the most spectacular character arc, you know, in the ring, I and mean, maybe in all of opera, the, the incredible richness of Brunhilde's uh, uh, development, far more than any of the, the male characters, yeah. have a much shorter route from, from one place to another. I don't know whether this was in your article, but I do know that I once had a public conversation with James Levine, and we were talking about that scene. And, and the ring in general. And he said to me that the hardest part of the ring for him to conduct, not musically, but emotionally, was that scene right there. And in general, the second act of Valkyrie was the hardest. You said, Gotte Damerung is a walk in the park compared to the challenges of getting it right and, and experiencing it as a musician, as a conductor, but also what was happening on the stage. Um, 
I mean, it's, it's this huge monologue, you know, and how yeah. do you handle a monologue, you know, musically? I mean, there has to be a, a tension kept up in it. There must be this sense in the, in the orchestra of this kind of smoldering, you know, atmosphere. Everything seems to go, sort of go completely to a kind of slow to a crawl, uh, but, but you have to be, <clears throat> there has to be this sense of, of the raw material for these, these explosions, you know, that, that, that take place, you know, in uh, uh, this multiple explosions in Wotan's personality. And so when you return to certain recordings, you just see how masterfully uh, this has been uh, handled. And above all, Hans Hotter, uh, the way Hans Hotter sings that scene on, on these recordings from Bayreuth in the 1850s um, with Clemens Krauss in uh, 53. 1950s. Uh, and uh, with uh, uh, my my personal favorite is Josef, Josef Kyleberg in in 1955, um, and and that scene is so riveting. I've never been able to understand people who say they they find the whole the whole kind of spectacle boring. <laughs> uh, for for me, this is this is just where I just completely am at the edge of my seat. You know, it's just it's just one of the most exciting moments in, in all of opera. I. Um want to refer listeners to a conversation in this series I did with James Morris on August 28th that can be found on YouTube in which we speak at length about that very scene. So mm -hmm. you'll get the Votan perspective on that. <laughs> um, so many places I could go. I, I think one more thing about the ring. Um, when I teach it, when I think about it, when I've written about it, I describe it as the work works of Wagner in which he is not cognizant or the characters and the situations are not cognizant of organized religion. So while we can infer some kind of Christian principle or Judaism or whatever we want in it, it's really not in the game plan. Whereas something like Lohengrin and Parsifal are steeped in Christianity and and I, I suppose in a different way, Flying Dutchman, which we haven't spoken about much at all. And frankly, I feel that the ring achieves its universality because it is not of a certain faith system, but a series of gods, the way the Greeks and the Romans and, and the Egyptian antiquities all were polytheistic, not monotheistic. And the gods are us and our frailties are their frailties and they are there to teach us and perhaps to learn from. Alex, do you think that when Gotadamarung ends, who, who comes next? Well, it's such a, it's left so wide open. You know, we've, we've, we've been given very little evidence in, in the cycle of sort of who are these other people you know, uh, uh, you know, we, we've met a few of the the Gibukungs, and they don't seem a very promising bunch. You know, for the sort of perpetuation of the of the human species, and, and you know, it's just, it's just very little clue. You know, who these other people are, um, and I mean, you could see it perhaps as a as a flaw of Wagner's whole construction um, that that he sort of builds towards such an enormous moment of of epiphany uh, and, and Brunhilde's breakthrough and, and her understanding and, and the spectacular scene of sort of the, the old world kind of falling to pieces without giving you sort of the slightest indication of, of, of what might follow. But I think it's actually a strength, you know, because it stops cold and, and you just have no clue what could possibly follow it. It, it just turns the whole situation back on the audience, you know, and just sort of, you know, leaves us with the, the problem, the question of, well, what, you know, what does come next and what, what are we going to do, you know, amid the wreckage of our own history to, to start something new. Um, and so I think if Wagner had actually tried to sketch some sort of you know utopia or sort of vision of, of what might follow uh it would have it would have limited um the, the creation and yeah i absolutely agree i mean that there there is no higher spiritual structure in the ring the gods are so human and so flawed uh and and so problematic, you know, uh, uh, that that you can't sort of look up to them at all. And sort yeah. of Botan takes care of that, you know, himself uh, by sort of plunging into the into the depths, um, and and sort of and you know, 
Siegfried, you know, seems to be kind of in the process of being offered up as, as some kind of savior, as sort of this uh, uh, hero uh, who, who, who's sort of the, the kind of uh, being equated with the sun, you know, uh, as, as he enters into uh, Brunhilde's uh, uh, world as some kind of young sun god. Uh, but he's a total what amazing f- music. You know, that, that music yeah, right yeah. there is just yeah. stunning. Uh, but Siegfried, you know, just it turns out quite poorly, and he's sort of enmeshed in politics and kind of the the the, the Gibukung Hagen uh, kind of uh, contraption in in, in Goethe Demerung. So he's pulled down. Uh, he's a disappointment. Um, and uh, and so yeah, there there is there is nothing higher. That w- it comes from below. I mean, there's, there's a spiritual. I think the spiritual principle of the ring is what the Rhine maidens uh, uh, say. You know, as as they are lamenting. Um, at the at the end of Rheingold, uh, as as the gods are are marching into their you know uh, uh, delusional uh, uh, ill-founded uh, palace, uh, and 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 they say um, what is trusty and true, uh, trial of uh, is is only in the depth. And everything up up above is is false, um, and and so it comes from the depths, and and it's just something that music that you hear at the very beginning of Rheingold, uh, the the deep bass E flat and the sort of E flat harmony that goes up uh, uh, from it. This is the spiritual foundation, but it's so deep that we we can't really touch it. We we can't really kind of. You know, it just it exists. We feel it, uh, but it's sort of very hard to figure out. You know, what is the kind of dwelling that we're going to make for ourselves in nature, uh, which which is the right one um, and and the true one. And uh, but that is yeah, it is sort of down below, is sort of where yeah. where truth and, and sort of spiritual greatness uh, resides. And sort of people seem to kind of touch it and sort of connect with it at various points. Um, but you know whether that will be possible in the future is, is, is unknown. I've attended 48 complete ring cycles and the New York Times a few years ago did an article about people called ring nuts and I was one of the nuts profiled. Mm-hmm. Uh, and therefore you and I and others like us often get so into this that I realize that sometimes there are people who don't necessarily, they're not as besotted or not as besotted yet as we are. And I want to point something out that you just said in passing, that when we approach any opera, any work, perhaps any song, um, there is both the music and the text, the words. And (coughs) many people read a libretto, the text, to understand, quote, understand what it's about. But it's then the music that gives all the subtlety and the emotion and the expression in each word and the reactions and often in the case of Wagner, nature, environment and such. And, you know, you and I have been talking both about what the Rhine Maiden might say, Voglinda might say, or what we hear and we toggle this back and forth, but that's part of the ongoing pleasure and fascination of all opera and certainly Wagner in that we can approach these on different levels. And the only thing I'll add, and then I want you to speak, please, is when I teach this stuff, I tell my audiences who tend to be intelligent people who just don't have yet a lot of contact with these works, don't analyze. Try as much as possible to leave outside all of your scholarship and your preconceived notions and your emotions and just let the music and the story work itself and then analyze after. You are a, take it from me, wonderful analyst of works that I love reading, whether you write about Wagner, really just about anyone, uh, Stravinsky certainly. And, but how do you put aside what you know when you approach a work you've never encountered before? Well, that is very important, you know. Um, to, as you say, to sort of find the non-analytical uh, uh, approach, uh, to sort of to, to experience opera, a- any form of music, um, as this this conduit of emotion, um, and I think 
you know, as, as much as as a music critic, you know, I, I, I can't uh, <laughs> I can't renounce uh, the sort of analytical uh, intellectual approach. Uh, but, you know, if I ever lose touch with with the emotional grounding, um, then then I think I have lost touch with with the spirit of of the music itself. And so, you know, and, and it's just becomes quite difficult in the case of Wagner, because I mean, there is so much to confront, and it feels as though there's so much you have to know uh, beforehand, and his biography, and then sort of all this question of he's in Dresden, he's in Paris, the scandals, the, the sort of uh, by the founding of Bayreuth, and Nietzsche, and the philosophers, and anti-Semitism, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then the... the, the Ilk. <laughs> the uh, the plots <laughs> of the of the operas themselves, which can be extremely complicated, and and uh, yeah, the ring is baffling unless you sort of sort of done sort of little bit of work of acquainting yourself with the uh, the the general situation. But it just doesn't work if you're you know if you you just have to uh, understand these components together, you know. And I think my own path to Wagner. Was was difficult, and I didn't fall in love with Wagner right away. And and partly the problem was I was experiencing it first purely as music, and I found these sort of orchestral excerpts just not very satisfying. You know, I, I, it seems sort of loud and, and and bombastic, but also kind of murky and sort of hard to grasp. Where were the themes? You know, what was the form? Um, and it just sounded like a lot of kind of flashy noise to me. Um, and you know, I was a fairly sophisticated listener as a kid, and I knew my Mozart and Beethoven and Schubert and Brahms, and I was actually listening to Bruckner and and, and Mahler uh, too. Who of course, you know, couldn't exist without Wagner, mm -hmm. but I, I I I understood them better than I understood Wagner. And the problem was, I was just listening to these orchestral excerpts. I was just listening to the to the musical services, um, and I think there's just so much missing when you're just sort of learning Wagner through these these famous excerpts. They can be actually very uh, deceiving. You know, the entry of the gods into Valhalla grandiose, magnificent sounding music, um, but it's a lie. You know, this is, this is, this is a, the, the music of, of, a, of, of, of sort of these people uh, striving after a power um, and a wealth that they have not earned. Um, and, and so it's, you, in the theater, you, you realize that it's an ironic spectacle. And when you hear the Rhine maidens uh, singing their lines, uh, you, you realize, you know, as Loga says, they're hurrying to their doom. Yeah. Um, and just if you're just listening to the music alone, you don't get that. You can't possibly get that from the music. And then if you're just looking at the text, I mean, that's a that's very difficult, you know, because Wagner was a, had a very eccentric kind of way with words and with the German language, and 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 it just kind of can look ridiculous on the on the page. But it's the combination. It's what happens when the words are combined with the music in the theatrical situation, the theatrical action that Wagner has devised. So I only really started getting it when I was seeing Wagner on stage um, at the Met in, in the 1990s, and suddenly I realized okay, <laughs> now I understand it. Now I understand how, how Wotan is this, this incredibly rich psychological character who's also kind of a, you know, he's a, he's a 19th century man as well. He's sort of a high bourgeois figure, sort of aristocrat who's struggling to maintain his position in a rapidly advancing sort of industrialized society. Um, and, and Alberich and, and, and the dwarves, you know, are sort of industry. And he's sort of trying to kind of uh, uh, seize hold of, 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 of their economy, sort of their, their, their production. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, that's the way into Wagner is, is is through seeing him, you know. Of course, now in this moment, uh, very little Wagner is is happening on stage, but there are all these wonderful videos, um, and and I think even just listening on recording, you know, if you're following the libretto and imagining, you know, what might be happening as you listen to the music and follow along with the words, it can sort of begin to uh, uh, to come together. So Wagner needs your full attention. And this is why he made Bayreuth the way he did. Uh, he didn't want distractions. Uh, he didn't want the, the audience sort of members looking at each other and checking out sort of the fashions, you know, he, the, the darkness of the space, the way all the seats were aligned toward the stage. It was just look at the stage and you have to focus on it kind of with every sense uh, that you have. Um, and so 
Wagner doesn't work as background music. Uh, you can't no. sort of listen to Wagner and be doing other stuff, you know. No. Uh, and and it's and it doesn't, you know, people might see as this kind of megalomaniacal demand that he makes, like you must pay attention to me. But it's just about it's just about being able to follow theater, and theater needs your your full attention. You know, you just can't you can't have Hamlet playing in the background while no. you're doing your <laughs> household chores. <laughs> um, it doesn't work that way. My dad was a professional trombonist and he was born in 1923 and his taste, his musical taste was very broad in that with the trombone, he could play classical, but also jazz. And the composers he most loved were the ones that were working or recently working around the time of his childhood. So Debussy, Ravel, Stravinsky, Gershwin, Duke Ellington, and so forth, Poulenc, um, Albin Berg, especially. But the other composers, he didn't go to as much opera as I ultimately wound up doing. He liked opera, but he was much more symphonic. And if he was invited to play in an opera, he would. But to him, Wagner was a great composer not for the stories or anything else, but the good trombone parts. <laughs> and he didn't think much of Verdi apart from Otello and Falstaff because the trombone parts were not very good. And I'm the one who had to really drag him into Verdi and mm -hmm. explain to him why Verdi is magnificent as well. I'm not going to do what a lot of people do is contrast Verdi and Wagner, whether people contrast Collis and, and Tibaldi and so forth. There's room for both. And they're both magnificent and Verdi is a great hero of mine as a man. But I do want to talk a bit about Wagner in Italy as we conclude, because Wagner heard the ring chords in Liguria. He traveled in Italy quite a bit. Uh, he wrote Parsifal in effect in three places in Mondello in uh, Sicily was the first act and Ravello in the second act, the gardens of Klingsor and Venice, the third act. And he wrote a lot of Lohengrin um, with Venice in mind, he said, because of the silence of the canals and the, the music that you hear in the prelude of Lohengrin is the silence of Venice. Imagine Venice before um, vehicles with motors <laughs> and even now in Venice, you can walk down a street and hear clattering dishes in someone's kitchen. Kitchen, And he died in Venice. And I don't know if you ever saw either the catalog of the exhibition, but a number of years ago, there was an exhibition in Venice about Wagner and Fortuny, the fabric maker. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I have yeah. the catalog if ever you need to see I it. Have, I okay. Have okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, and his relationship to fine things, so to speak. He, he did like silk and fabric and so on. Um, but also he did have very refined taste and he didn't necessarily introduce that to all of his characters, but certain characters would have a graciousness, a culture about them that might not be that they knew good fabrics, but that they were refined. I would say that Elizabeth and Tannhäuser would be one of those people, perhaps. And the way he infuses them, the um, maybe a couple of the guild members in the Meistersinger would be other examples. But in your travels and your study for this book, Wagner and Italy, what would you want to say about that? Oh well, I had a I had a glorious time sort of retracing Wagner's steps in in Italy. I had the huge fortune of having a month long residency at the American Academy in Rome, um, which is just a fantastic experience in and of itself. Um, and, and I went on sort of various, this was uh, back in 2011, I was just I was sort of really seriously setting to work on the book. Um, and, and so I would take these little trips that were kind of, you know, Wagner, um, uh, Wagner weekend uh, trips. Um, I'd been to Venice before, of course, but, but on that trip, I, I went with Wagner very much in mind uh, and I was able to go inside the uh, Palazzo Vendramin and, and see the, uh, the quarters uh, where, where Wagner lived with the help of um, the 
Venice Wagner Society, um, and uh, sort of the other uh, Venice locales, the the Palazzo Giustiniani where he lived while, while he was working on uh, Tristan for a time, um, and then going further down the coast and, and going to uh, Sorrento, and uh, I sort of blew a fairly large amount of money uh, on a. Uh, uh, Ocean facing, a sea facing suite uh, at the uh, uh, at the Vittoria uh, Hotel uh, where Wagner lived, you know, for, for a number of and weeks. And Caruso. Yeah, uh -huh. um, yeah. I just have the experience, you know. Um, and I did notice sort of wh wherever Wagner went, I mean, it, it was it's just a series of just lovely places, you know. I mean, if you just follow his footsteps, you, you find yourself in some some gorgeous locales, and and some of the hotels are still there, and they're, they're very nice hotels. Um, and and so there is this luxury, you know, uh, around uh, Wagner, um, and and there's this refinement, and 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 it's not these aren't qualities that we necessarily associate with him because you know, he did have this yearning for sort of manly, rough, heroic uh, um, uh, images and, and then sort of characters. And I think that was kind of a, a, a longing in him. You know, he was this, this short um, kind of restless, uh, um, kind of um, sort of perpetually kind of um, uh, 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 Kind of scurrying around, uh, kind of curious guy, you know, who, uh, you know, uh, is, was not any kind of, you know, towering male specimen, <laughs> and so he was, he, you know, that's that's sort of what he was yearning towards. But, but, uh, yeah, that I think that you you can detect that that refinement at moments in in the operas, and these moments of great delicacy and and intimacy, and, and Wagner and I, I cherish those very much, and they're all the more striking amid this sort of apparatus around them, sort of these very grand, you know, uh, uh, soundscapes and, and sort of these big constructions. So it's all the more piercing when you come across a moment like that in Dr. Act Two, that, that, that little orchestral uh, passage. Um, and yeah, I think it's so important always to keep in mind Wagner's Europeanness, you know, because we think of him as German, 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 sort of so essentially German. But, but he did spend a great deal of his life outside of Germany. Uh, he was a wanderer, uh, an, an outcast uh, for, for a good period of his life. And, and the, the operas themselves are full of wanderers. Um, it's just this sort of the, the, maybe the essential uh, Wagner character. And, and you know, the, the settings of the Wagner operas are sort of pan-European. Uh, European. First yeah. of all, it takes place in Northern Spain. People always sort of overlook that fact. Um, and, you know, uh, Lohengrin is in uh, Antwerp and, and uh, Italian locales and the early operas and-, and uh, um, Norway. Norway for Flying Dutchman, uh, uh, Cornwall and uh, Brittany for for Rome uh, for uh, Rienzi. Tristan, Rome for yeah. Rienzi. Uh, yeah, so I mean, uh, you know, the, the 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 two operas that are sort of very unmistakably located in Germany uh, are are Tannhäuser um, and Meistersinger, of course. I mean, you know, Meistersinger is the most kind of the, the one completely rooted, you know, in Germany. I mean, the ring, a lot of the ring presumably takes place in Germany, but I don't know, you know, <laughs> in the area of the Rhine, you know, it's sort of, yeah. it's sort of hard to pin down. Um, and so, yeah, so this is sort of these, these revolving European locales and, and there's sort of all the different places that, uh, that Wagner lived. Something else I have is this uh, very recent publication uh, of um, this lush, uh, lavish coffee table book showing everywhere that Wagner ever lived. Uh, mm. It's in German, Wanderer heißt nicht die Welt. Um, and, and there's hundreds of different places that, 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 he, that he lived. Um, and so there was kind of a, there was a sort of homelessness about Wagner. I don't think he actually ended up enjoying living in Bayreuth. Uh, I, I think he found no. it rather defining. Um, and so he, he, you know, he was ostensibly for health reasons uh, in his last years, he was going to Italy um, in, in the winters. But, but I think, um, I think if he'd lived longer, he, he might have, who knows where he would have ended up. And then this idea that he wanted to emigrate to America, you know, at a certain point. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so yeah, this, this um, yeah, I just, so yeah, retracing his steps in, in Italy and, and the fact that I began the book in Venice with his death sort of makes the point, I think, about his Europeanness, about he's sort of bigger than just a purely German artist. Would you settle something that I hear people talk about and I don't have quite an answer on it? 
that he wanted to be buried in Venice and that Cosima insisted he be transported back to Bayreuth for burial? I don't know. I haven't heard that. Uh, I, I, Venetians I tell me that. Across that. Yeah. Sorry? Venetians tell me that because the San Michele is, an, is a burial island and Stravinsky is there and Diaghilev, maybe I'm not sure. And um, allegedly, at least the Venetians want you to think that he yeah. wanted to stay in Venice. He did make a plan for the for the burial ground at, yeah. at Bayreuth in the yard behind Bonfried and, and uh, uh, the beloved dogs were, were buried there and presumably he would have wanted to be next to the dogs. Um, so I'm not sure <laughs> about that that Venetian uh, uh, idea, but but the fact that he that he died, you know, outside of Germany is just significant uh, in and of itself. And I think he I think he would have who knows, but I just, it might've been satisfying for him, you know, to die there, you know, as opposed to dying in Bayreuth. Maybe that's sort of, you know, because he, he, he felt that he belonged, you know, in so many places and not just in Germany. You remind me of the fact that his father-in-law, of course, was Franz Liszt. His second wife was Cosima Liszt. And Liszt had it in his will that he is to be buried where he dies. And he died in Bayreuth. And his grave is not at Von Fried. It's in a cemetery a little bit away and not quite the grave that I think a man of that stature would deserve given his, his power and influence in his lifetime. But it, when I think about this and I always think about I'm traveling that, you know, what if something happens and I'm to be buried in Newark or whatever? I <laughs> Nothing wrong with Newark, but. <laughs> right, yeah. I think there's something melancholy about List dying in Bayreuth. I mean, yeah. the, the two men had this very powerful, uh, close relationship, but there was also a, an enormous amount of tension uh, between them. And uh, yeah, you you would have wished that 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 List could have died, you know, outside of Wagner's uh, immediate shadow. You know, yeah. of course, Cosima. Uh, this happened in the middle of the festival that List died in 1886, and mm -hmm. and and. And for Cosimo, the show must go on. So the, the performances <laughs> proceeded uninterrupted, and there was no sort of grand kind of spectacle that sort of list you know, would have you know, deserved, you know, in terms of his memorial and his sort of funeral. Um, and yeah, sort of that's Cosimo was herself a magnificently complicated character. And her diaries were fascinating. Yes. I want to read for listeners, uh, Alex, as all my guests do, give recommended listening. And it shouldn't surprise you, although Alex knows all kinds of music, that the picks are all Wagnerian, that you can find that Adagio. Uh, Clemens Krauss 1953 ring, especially uh, Wotan and Die Valkyra. Frida Leiter and Lawrence Melchior singing in Tristan und Isolde. The Furt, uh, the, uh, Furt Wengler conducting of Tristan und Isolde, especially the, the Prelude to Act Three. Uh, Nopperts Bush conducting a Parsifal 1964, and Toscanini conducting Meister Singer's Prelude to Act Three. Um, I noticed that, I mean, thank you for these, and I love them all, that the so-called romantic operas, Flying Dutchman, Tannhäuser, and Lohengrin didn't make the cut. Any reason? <laughs> well, no, I, I I love them. Um, although, to be absolutely honest, I, I always have a bit of trouble with Tannhäuser. Um, it's it's not at the top of my list of the of the Wagner operas, but but I, I do. I especially adore Lohengrin. I, I have a weakness for Lohengrin. It's, I, I accept that that the, the, the sort of whole plot is is ridiculous, really. Um, but but it just it wins me. The the prelude itself uh, just sort of completely makes me melt. Uh, which is funny because this was the the first Wagner I ever tried to listen to when I was ten or twelve. Uh, I checked out uh, these long playing records of Lohengrin from the public library, and and just had no success whatsoever with it. But now, you know, just the very sound of those first few measures of of Lohengrin uh, sort of puts a, a spell on me. Um, but I mean, it is the the later Wagner is just bigger and and more complex, and and the, these these are the pieces that that. Um, that I just go back to again and again, and just always find new dimensions in, um, and and that just sort of I've sort of lived with them for long enough in my life that I sort of see my own life reflected in them and my own experiences. So, yeah, I don't I don't mean to to uh, uh, 
uh, spurn or neglect uh, the, the the early operas. It's it's wonderful music, but these I mean just these these moments. There's just this almost infinite depth of of just kind of sort of human complexity and sort of in, in 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 these in these moments. He's just sort of working on the on the biggest canvas um, and just sort of grappling with sort of such sort of elemental questions in, in all of the all of the operas from the Ring uh, onward. But that they sort of have to dominate my list. When I study and teach these operas, um, a word that I often apply, which I picked up from Wagner, of course, Glaube, belief. Um, to me, Lohengrin, Tannhäuser, The Flying Dutchman, certainly center around belief and willingness to accept or reject something as we see it and as it's told to us and and in the ring that's played out in the concept of Brunhilde not wanting to follow a law because it's a law but doing what she knows to be right mm -hmm. and she therefore is a leap far beyond the the three operas I just mentioned and I find a great current in Wagner is not just knowledge but belief mm -hmm. and that's why I asked you before about his Christianity mm -hmm. and where what we hang on to in in a world where so much is chaos and paranoia then now perhaps always and I think that to me one of the central issues of Wagner is his understanding of the human condition that he teased out and played out and elaborated so magnificently in so many different ways and you have a quote in the book of his from 1854, the essence of reality lies in its endless multiplicity. Only what changes is real. So I spent about 12 hours digesting that one. <laughs> and I mentioned this, I, I know we have to conclude because this book is so full of things that just stop you in your tracks in the best way and make you think and make you reflect. And that is Wagner's achievement, but it's also your achievement in that you were able to capture them, not, it didn't feel like a checklist to me. It felt like study and reflection and understanding. And um, I'm not certain if the essence of reality lies in only what changes being real, but it gives you a lot to think about as this book does. And as you have today, and I'm very grateful to you, Alex. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Fred. This was a huge pleasure to talk with you, and and just to hear your own perspectives is is so rich for me. So I'm very grateful for it. Thank you. And I meant to just say one more thing. When I was first typing my notes to begin the preparation to talk to you, I kept typing Wagnerism, and my spell check kept changing it to Wagnerish. <laughs> 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 and I finally yeah. had to do a default so that my computer would learn the term Wagnerism and not just Wagnerish because my friend you are anything but Wagnerish. Thank you. <laughs> that could so be a much. TV show, Wagnerish. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alex. I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, Fred. Be well. Bye.